Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to the latest installment in the Black Hat webcast series. Today's event, Securely Implementing Network Protocols, Detecting and Preventing Logical Flaws, brought to you by Black Hat, NS Focus, and UBM. My name is Steve Paul. I'm with Black Hat. I'm your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive between you and our presenters, and later in the program, we'll ask for your feedback. There is no dial-in required. You're participating in listen-only mode, where audio and slides will be synchronized to your computer speakers. If you're calling in, please use uh, your access code and audio pin. Close out of any unnecessary applications and disable your pop-up blockers. We strongly encourage participation and are happy to take your questions and comments. You can participate in our Q&A session by asking questions at any time. Simply type your question into the text box located at the bottom right of your console. Uh, a PDF uh, copy of the presentations will be found on the Black Hat website over the next few days. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please refer to the help link in the upper right-hand corner of your console. And now on to the presentation, Securely Implementing Network Protocols, Detecting and Preventing Logical Flaws. Discussing today's topic will be Mathieu Van Hoof, postdoctoral researcher at KU Leuven, and our presenter sponsor, Cody Mercer, Senior Security Engineer with a concentration in Threat Intelligence Research at NSF Focus. First, we'll hear from Mati. Over to you, Maddie. Okay, thank you, Paul. So today I'm going to talk about how to securely implement network protocols. And the idea is that uh, this is both to prevent net to prevent uh, logical flaws before you implement a plot, uh, protocol, or if you have already implemented a protocol, to then detect logical vulnerabilities in implementations of your uh, network protocol. So why is this important? Well, if you look at uh, existing uh, protocols, we see that uh, many of them have been affected by logical vulnerabilities. For example, if we look at uh, TLS, we can see that we have, uh, broadly speaking, two categories of flaws. On one hand, we have design flaws, which are really logical flaws in the specification in the standard of this protocol. On the other hand, we also have implementation flaws. So some examples of design flaws are uh, the beast attack, the poodle attack, and the lucky 13 attack. And in general, because these are logical design flaws, uh, these are hard to patch using just uh, an, an update. You really need to change the specification of the protocol. An exception here is the lucky 13 attack. That one could have been, uh, can be prevented uh, by uh, impl implementing mitigations in software. However, the beast on Poodle attack, they really required a change uh, to the protocol. On the case of TLS, uh, that would be solved by using the latest TLS uh, version. However, we also uh, see that TLS libraries were vulnerable to several logical implementation flaws. Um, some examples are the early CCS attack, the freak attack, uh, the logjam attack. Um, and to focus a bit more on the CCS attack, to give an example there, the flaw there was that OpenSSL accepted the CCS packet, which normally activates encryption of uh, data. Uh, it accepted it too early in the handshake. And this can be abused by a man in the middle attacker to decrypt traffic and also to inject traffic if both endpoints were using a vulnerable OpenSSL library. So what's unique about these implementation flaws is that they are generally applicable, like a certain vulnerability is only affects one specific implementation. Um, and these can be patched by updating the code, uh, creating these patches and distributing them uh, to all the people using uh, this library. And TLS is not the only protocol affected by logical vulnerabilities if we look at Wi-Fi. We also see that it has uh, logical design flaws as well as implementation flaws. Uh, for example, it's well known that web is completely broken. Uh, we also have Wi-Fi protected uh, setup, so WPS. That is also known to contain a design flaw, uh, which can be exploited. Uh, and recently, there has been a paper uh, 
published at the academic CCS conference, which will be presented in a few months, uh, which will discuss about key reinstallation attacks uh, that affect the WPA2 standard. However, more interesting uh, for us is that this protocol was also affected by implementation flaws. And in this uh, presentation, I'm going to uh, go into more detail about uh, logical vulnerabilities that we found in the Wi-Fi protocol. Uh, and some examples are that some implementation have a bad state machine. They do not try to protect or detect uh, downgrade attacks. Uh, on some other works as well, which I've shown that uh, certain implementation use a predictable amount of randomness, uh, which can be exploited as well. And for completeness, we also have the SSH protocol. Uh, a few years ago, it has been shown that it's certain ciphers are vulnerable to a plain text recovery attack. And on the side of implementations, we also uh, saw, or other researchers have shown that certain libraries also have a bad state machine, which it can again uh, be exploited by an attacker. So let's go. Uh, so what we're going to focus on in this presentation are these uh, logical implementation flaws, uh, because these can be detected, these can be fixed, unpatched, uh, and can be prevented. So I'm first going to focus a bit more on the, some TLS flaws that were detected uh, to show you how researchers are currently discovering these logical flaws of the techniques that were previously used uh, to accomplish this. And if we look at some recent work uh, on TLS and SSL libraries, we see that several works have found bugs in the state machine uh, that are behind these implementations. Now, what do I mean with state machine? The state machine basically defines uh, which packets are accepted at a certain time and uh, the response that an implementation is supposed to send. And one of the first uh, bugs in these state machines was discovered by Kikuchi, and uh, he discovered uh, that OpenSSL accepts the CCS packet uh, too early in the TLS handshake. And he found this by manually inspecting uh, several uh, SSL and TLS libraries, and he basically had a hunch that certain implementations were incorrectly handling this uh, CCS packet. So in a sense, this was found by a bit of luck, by just manually uh, inspecting code and having a hunch about it. Now, probably this discovery by Kikuchi motivated academic researchers to study state machines uh, behind TLS uh, protocols in more details and to study them uh, more rigorously. So in 2015, we saw that uh, Berdouche uh, et al., they uh, more rigorously tried to uh, detect logical vulnerabilities in these state machines behind the SSL and TLS protocol. And how did they accomplish this? Well, the first thing that they did is they manually defined the state machine uh, of, in a sense, a perfect implementation of SSL and TLS. This is the way the protocol is supposed to behave, the way it is defined in the standard. And then they took this uh, the state machine, this in, in a sense, the abstract model of TLS, and they used that to generate invalid SSL and TLS handshakes. And the idea here is that uh, an implementation of TLS is supposed to reject these invalid handshakes. And if we find an implementation that somehow accepts these invalid handshakes, then this implementation is deviating from the standard, which likely means that there's a bug, and possibly this bug may be an exploitable vulnerability. And using this approach, they found uh, quite a lot of uh, vulnerabilities in OpenSSL and also other uh, SSL and TLS uh, libraries. So later in 2016, uh, the Reuter and Paul um, came with a variation of uh, the approach uh, by the researchers in 2015. And they sort of had the opposite approach. Instead of first manually defining the state machine that an SSL library is supposed to implement, they came up with a way to extract the state machine behind an existing TLS implementation. And they were able to do this, do this in a black box manner. They did not need access to the source code. So the idea there is they take the OpenSSL library, for example, they 
uh, use a machine a state machine learning algorithm to uh, automatically construct the state machine that this library implements and then they manually inspect the state machine to see whether something strange is going on for example um, there might be uh, strange transitions that you can skip certain uh, messages in the handshake and these might be uh, used to attack the protocol. So in other words, an expert uh, on the TLS protocol manually inspects these extracted state machines. And this work again led to the discovery of uh, several bugs uh, on some vulnerabilities as well. And I think the general lesson here is that um, Kikuchi in 2014, he, pli he applied manual inspection and he found one bug, but then these researchers uh, use the more rigorous method, uh, which relies on uh, formally defining the state machine or extracting the state machine, and that really discovered a lot of uh, vulnerabilities. So I would say the lesson here is that uh, you should use a model-based uh, type of testing to detect uh, these logical vulnerabilities, and specifically, for example, vulnerabilities in the state machine. So what do I mean with model-based testing? Basically, it's a well-known technique uh, which is used to test if a program behaves according to some formal model. In other words, whether your implementation is actually uh, following the requirements or not. Uh, and I shown this was has proven to be very successful against uh, TLS. So the goal of my presentation now is to uh, as an example, in a sense, apply this model-based testing approach to the Wi-Fi handshake. Um, and I will discuss how we did this, and I will also uh, discuss some of the vulnerabilities we discovered, so you can have an idea of the type of uh, bugs uh, or like, yeah, vulnerabilities that these kind of techniques are able to discover in an implementation. And I believe that uh, this technique can also be applied to other protocols. So if you have your own protocol, you could try to ap apply a uh, approach uh, similar to ours or approach similar to the previously uh, mentioned academic works. So in order to do this, in order to explain uh, how we tested uh, implementations of the Wi-Fi handshake, I'm first going to briefly introduce uh, how the Wi-Fi handshake works. So. What does the Wi-Fi handshake do? Well, its first purpose is, of course, to discover nearby networks. Um, and once a client has discovered a network, it will connect to this network. And then the Wi-Fi handshake provides mutual authentication between both the client and the access point. Um, it will negotiate a fresh uh, pairwise session key, which is used to actually encrypt normal data traffic, for example, IP traffic, after the handshake has completed. And finally, the Wi-Fi handshake also protects uh, against downgraded attacks. And why does it need to protect against downgraded attacks? Well, because in a normal Wi-Fi network, a client can select uh, the cipher it wants to use. Now, more specifically, a Wi-Fi network uh, generally supports either WPAT KIP or AES CCMP, or perhaps both. Now, WPAT KIP, um, it's actually a deprecated protocol. It was a short-term solution designed to replace uh, web, which was able to run on old web compatible hardware, which means it has some uh, design limitations and there are existing attacks against uh, WPA TKIP. So you should no longer be using this protocol. Uh, instead, you have a more long-term solution, uh, AES CCMP, and that's the one that you should be using. But in other words, a client can advertise support for both these protocols, and when a client connects to a network, it has to pick one of these. So how does the Wi-Fi handshake now work? Well, we have our client uh, on the left side, or on the access point on the right side. So as mentioned, uh, the first part in the sense of the Wi-Fi handshake is that the access point periodically transmit beacons to advertise its presence to nearby clients. And when the client then detects that uh, uh, there is an access point that uh, he or she wants to connect to, it will first select a cipher uh, that he wants to use, for example, AES CCMP. And then the client will send an association request to the access point. And basically that informs the access point, hey, I'm a client, I want to connect to your network, and this is the cipher that I want to use uh, to encrypt uh, my data. If the access point uh, accepts the client, then it will start the four-way Wi-Fi handshake, 
Uh, and this four-way handshake is used to, uh, among other things, negotiate the session keys. And as the name implies, the four-way handshake is defined using four messages. And the first two messages, as shown here, they are used to generate this fresh uh, session key, which will be used to actually decrypt frames. So uh, in message one, the access points sends uh, random nonce, so the nonce of the access point, the A nonce. And in message two, uh, the client, also called the supplicant, will send the S nonce, in other words, the supplicant nonce. And these two random nonsense combined with a pre-shared secret are used to generate this uh, fresh uh, session key. And then uh, the second part of the four-way handshake is basically used to detect and prevent downgrade attacks. More specifically, in message three, the access point includes uh, the supported ciphers in an authenticated manner, meaning an adversary cannot mess or modify message three. Uh, in contrast, the beacons that also contain the supported ciphers, that's unauthenticated, meaning an attacker could uh, modify a beacon and say, hey, this network only supports TKIP, but then message three would contain the authenticated list of ciphers and that would say, no, this network actually supports TKIP and uh, AES CCMP. So when the client receives message three, it verifies whether um, the cipher list in the beacons was not modified. And if the client doesn't detect anything suspicious, it will send message four to the access point, informing the access point, hey, everything is okay. Uh, I didn't detect the downgrade attack, so we can continue uh, with the protocol. There is one last thing that uh, I didn't explain yet, and that's that message three, message two, uh, also contains the chosen cipher of the client in an authenticated manner. That's because, again, the association request here, it's not authenticated, meaning an attacker could manipulate it or forge it. And when the access point receives message two, it can securely verify whether um, the chosen cipher in the association request indeed matches the one in message two. Now, this check is there mainly to make the handshake more robust, because strictly speaking, it is not required. So, for example, let's say that an access point does not verify the chosen cipher here, then it is not possible to execute a downgrade attack, because we still have this check by the client uh, when it receives message three. Okay, so that covers the messages that are exchanged in the handshake. The final part to explain is how are these messages defined? And well, they are defined using uh, EAPOL frames. And this screenshot here from Wireshark shows all the frames that make, uh, all the fields that uh, make up an EAPOL frame. Uh, luckily, we don't need to know them all for this presentation. Uh, we can drastically simplify this frame uh, and we can just present that an EAPOL frame has a header defining the source, the destination, and also what type of message it is. For example, the header file uh, defines whether this is message one, two, three, or four, and so on. There's a replay counter as well, and it has a MIC, which stands for Message Integrity Code, which is used to detect downgrade, uh, which is used to verify the authenticity of the frame. Uh, finally, it also has a key data field, uh, but that's not very important uh, for us. Okay, so we now covered the background on the Wi-Fi handshake, how it works. So how does our testing technique work? Works? How do we detect logical vulnerabilities? Well, the idea is we start from our normal handshake execution, so the one shown here, and in a sense, we're going to treat this as our formal abstract model. This is how a handshake is supposed to behave. And we're going to take this normal handshake uh, execution, and we're going to apply so-called test generation rules to this normal execution of the handshake. Now, what do I mean with a test generation rule? Well, one example of a test generation rule is that, uh, for example, it drops certain messages from the handshake. And of course, if you're going to drop certain messages from the handshake, then the handshake should no longer successfully complete. Uh, and another example of a test generation rule is that uh, you repeat or replay certain messages in the handshake. On that, does not negatively affect the handshake because in, in a Wi-Fi network, it's common that some messages are lost and that they are retransmitted. Meaning this specific modification 
would still result in a handshake that should be successful and should result in a successful connection. So these test generation rules, um, they basically apply correct and incorrect modification to this normal handshake. And the idea is that by defining various types of test generation rules, we can test several edge cases and implementations of this handshake. And one advantage of these test generation rules is that they allow some creativity. For example, we can define a test generation rule that sorry, that purely applies uh, to the Wi-Fi handshake but doesn't apply to the TLS or SSH handshake. One small limitation of our technique is that we assume that these test generation rules are independent. In other words, we do not apply two or three test generation rules at the same time because that would mean we have to try all possible combinations which would result in an exponential state uh, space explosion and we don't have uh, enough time in real life to test all that. Okay, so we have our normal handshake, we apply these test generation rules and then we get a set of test cases. Now, what do I mean with a test case here? Well, a test case basically defines the messages that we want to send to an implementation under test and the replies we expect in return. And if we don't get this expected reply, then something is wrong. The second part that the test case defines is whether this results in a successful connection or not. Because sometimes you may always get the reply, replies that you expect, but it should not yet result in a successful connection. For example, let's say that you drop the last uh, message, message exchange in the handshake, then yeah, you always got the expected replies, but the handshake isn't finished yet. Meaning we should not yet be able to uh, send data frames to the implementation under test. Okay, so we have our test cases. Uh, how are we going to execute these test cases? Well, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, we take a test case, uh, we run it. If we get an unexpected reply, we're going to save this test case, and then we're going to reset the implementation under test. And for the Wi-Fi handshake, this basically means sending a deauthentication message to the implementation under test. Uh, for a TLS library, this would mean uh, closing the TCP connection, for example. Let's say we always got the expected replies, then we're going to see if the connection is successful. And to do this, we're going to send uh, an ARP request to the implementation. And if we get a reply back, that means that um, the implementation under test consider the handshake to be successful. And we're going to expect whether, uh, we're going to check whether this is the expected result or not. If not, we're ex again going to save the failed test case. Otherwise, um, we can just reset the implementation under test and execute the next test case. So as you can uh, imagine, we're now going to focus after this purely on the failed test cases. And then the idea is that an expert examines why these test cases have failed. This can be done by either uh, checking the source code and finding the root cause of the vulnerability, or if you are testing an implementation where you do not have access to the source code, you can uh, carry out additional black box test. And then the idea is that this expert determines whether just this is a benign deviation from the standard, or whether it's a bug, or whether it's actually an exploitable vulnerability. Okay, so to come back to the test, generation rules. I already gave uh, a few examples, but broadly speaking, we can define uh, two categories. The first category manipulates messages as a whole. For example, you just drop a message or you repeat or you replay a message. Um, in other words, they do not modify individual fields of a message because that's what our second category of uh, test generation rules do. They take one handshake message and modify certain properties of this message. An example is that you can send a message with a bad replay counter, you can change fields in the header. For example, you can construct a message tree, but then uh, change the header such that the header says that, no, this is actually message one. Then you can see how an implementation would react to that. We can also give a bad message integrity uh, check value. Uh, in other words, that it has a bad uh, authenticity check. 
And there are some other things we can do as well. As mentioned, we can be quite creative with this, which on one part is a challenge because you have to come up with these test generation rules. On the other hand, it really allows you to define very unique uh, testing rules on that can really help in defining and finding a lot of uh, bugs. So we applied uh, this technique uh, to 12 access points. So we did not test clients, we only tested access points. And we have open source implementations, closed source ones. We also tested uh, professional equipment. And a bit to our surprise is that we actually discovered quite some vulnerabilities, which, which of course is a, a very nice result. But we did not expect this to be the case because the Wi-Fi handshake is fairly simple. The most important part is this four-way handshake where we have four messages that are being exchanged. So our, our initial, initial hunch was that uh, we weren't going to discover that much. However, I think because we focused on logical vulnerabilities that we did discover several issues. So our, our, we think that yeah, traditional programming mistakes, uh, they are being avoided like buffer overflows, double freeze, but these logical issues or at least logical bugs, they can still be widespread. So I'm going to discuss a few of these logical vulnerabilities to give you an idea about what kind of bugs our technique uh, can detect. Um, and I'm going to discuss the most important and interesting ones. The first one is that the MediaTek and Telenet implementation of uh, an access point, they do not verify the selected cipher in message two uh, of the four-way handshake. So remember that I said that this check here is only for robustness, meaning this is just a bug. It is not a vulnerability because it cannot be exploited to perform a downgrade attack because we still have this check here uh, by the client when it receives message three. However, inspired by this finding, we also manually audited the code, the code of these two access points, and we found that the MediaTek client also ignores the supported cipher list in message three of the handshake. And that, of course, leads to a trivial downgrade attack. An attacker can simply uh, set up a rogue access point, can only advertise uh, support for WPA TKIP. The client will select WPA TKIP, and when it receives the real supported cipher list of the real access point in message three, well, it does not compare that to the ones in the beacons, so this downgrade attack is not detected. The second bug that we, or a second bug that we discovered is in the uh, Windows 7 hotspot. So the Windows 7 allows you to set up a, a Wi-Fi hotspot, which is basically an infrastructure hotspot just as a real uh, Wi-Fi access point uh, on a router. And here, if the client sends one association request to the access point, everything is okay. But if it sends two association requests rapidly after one another, then something goes wrong and we don't get any replies at all. Interestingly, if then a few seconds or minutes later we send a new association request, then the access point will reply association rejected, you are not allowed to connect. Now the surprising thing here is that if another client now tries to connect, that will work just fine. The access point will receive the association request and it will start the four-way handshake. So we don't have access to the, the source code of Windows 7 here, uh, but what we conjecture that is going wrong is that the access point maintains certain state uh, of this client and somehow by sending two association requests, the state uh, associated to the client gets corrupted. However, the state associated to other clients, well, that's still, um, that's not corrupted, meaning other clients can still successfully connect. Of course, as an attacker, we can abuse this. We can impersonate the client. We can send association requests in name of the client. Um, and then we can cause a specific client, so a specific MAC address to no longer connect to the access point. So this is a targeted denial of service attack. Another interest on the uh, proof of concept uh, of this code uh, can be found uh, online at the following URL, uh, including a, a video demonstration as well. So a second uh, vulnerability that we discovered um, is a flaw in the access point implementation uh, of Broadcom. And 
What goes wrong there is that Broadcom cannot distinguish message two and message four of the handshake. Now, what do I mean with this? What I mean is that when Broadcom is expecting message four of the handshake, but it's actually receiving message two, that will simply treat message two as if it were message four. Now, this can be abused to downgrade the access point into using a TKIP. I'm not going to explain this attack in detail. It's a bit, little bit intricate, but the conclusion is we can use this to downgrade the access point into using TKIP, meaning it will now send data frames encrypted using this weak cipher, which internally uses RC4. Now note that we cannot downgrade the clients. We can only downgrade the access point. And the reason this bug is very interesting is because if we read the official Wi-Fi specification, it says that message four actually doesn't serve any cryptographic purpose at all. They say it's simply there to uh, ensure reliability. Our attack contradicts this because we have shown that if an access point uh, incorrectly handles uh, message three, uh, message four, then we can downgrade the access point. In other words, yeah, our work, our attack here shows that message four is absolutely essential. In other words, this shows that the uh, Wi-Fi specification is wrong uh, in claiming that message four can be dropped from the handshake. Okay, now to discuss uh, one of the uh, last attacks that we found. Um, here we found a man in the middle attack against the OpenBSD client. And this was initially discovered by actually testing the OpenBSD access point. Because we found a, a small state machine bug in the implementation of OpenBSD's access point. And then we also manually inspected the state machine of the client because who knows, it might have had similar vulnerabilities. And here we found that the client isn't implementing a state machine at all. And this is really surprising because OpenBSD is known for its security. Um, you're not immediately going to find any buffer overflows or double freeze, but because of this logical vulnerability, because the state machine is missing, all your security is still lost. We can still, uh, we can bypass in a sense the complete uh, Wi-Fi handshake because the state machine is missing. So I'm quickly going to explain how this uh, attack works. So we have our victim here, OpenBSD client. We have our rogue access point, the attacker. When the client now wants to connect to the network, it will send an association request. And sorry, normally, um, a real access point would now start the four-way handshake as we discussed previously. However, our rogue access point will now uh, send message one, the group key handshake. Now the group key handshake, you can think of it as being similar to the four-way handshake, except that it's defined using only two messages and basically the group key handshake transports the group key called GT key here uh, towards uh, the client. So the group key is used to encrypt broadcast on multicast data. Now normally, a secure implementation of the client will reject this message one of the group key because the four-way handshake hasn't been uh, executed yet. In other words, the Wi-Fi handshake wasn't completed yet. But because the victim doesn't implement the state machine, it will accept whatever handshake packet we send to it. So OpenBSD will try to process this handshake message, this group key handshake message. Now it will try to verify the authenticity of this frame, and it will try to verify it using its current session key. However, it hasn't negotiated a session key yet, meaning th this key in memory is basically an array of all zeros. So this uh, group message one, yeah, OpenBSD will try to verify the authenticity, but using an all zero key. So as an attacker, uh, we can indeed forge uh, this message. After this, uh, the OpenBSD client will reply using a uh, group message two, uh, and the handshake is considered uh, complete then and OpenBSD will open its data port, meaning it will now send and accept uh, normal data traffic. Now, an interesting remark here is that OpenBSD, while it now accepts data traffic, it hasn't installed uh, a Wi-Fi key to encrypt data, meaning it will actually send plain text data and it will receive plain text data as well. 
So if you as an attacker attacked uh, an OpenBSD client, not only will the attacker be able to read data, but everyone around the client will now be able to intercept this plain text data as well. So this is quite a serious attack. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the type of uh, vulnerabilities we can discover, and it gives a rough overview of how our testing technique uh, works. So again, we of this attack, we also have a proof of concept available uh, online. Uh, we also discovered several other issues, uh, and you can read uh, our academic paper uh, to get an overview of all these things uh, that we found. Now, there are some limitations to this uh, testing technique. We do not know the amount of uh, code coverage, and we only sell sent well form packets. Uh, additionally, these test generation rules are applied independently. However, I think this testing technique is very promising because first and for all, uh, we have shown that the Wi-Fi handshake is very simple, yet we found quite some uh, interesting vulnerabilities and interesting bugs. So even though we have these implementations, uh, this is a promising technique. Additionally, because it's a black box testing mechanism, you don't need access to the source code. So to conclude uh, this work, some general uh, lessons uh, that I found to avoid logical bugs. I think one important uh, piece of advice is that if you find a vulnerability in your uh, product or in your network protocol, you should try to generalize this bug. We have seen this in the case of SSL and TLS. Uh, first, someone manually discovered one bug, then researchers tried to uh, find similar types of bugs and they discover a lot. And we also found this in my own research. So really the advice is if uh, you find a bug in your code, try to generalize it, try to see if this highlights some kind of design issue, if there are similar bugs, or if there's a bug in uh, a protocol that is very similar to you or in a competitor's uh, library. Also learn the bugs they are vulnerable to, to and see if they apply to your product as well. Uh, the other piece of advice is you can of course use a testing technique similar to the one uh, that I just explained. Some other high level advice is if you write a protocol, write detailed requirements and check these requirements. And if you do a code review uh, of your protocol, ideally this is done by a domain expert that really knows how this uh, network protocol works. because. Uh, well, what doesn't work is that if you do a standard code review, you're going to detect common programming mistakes like buffer overflows, double freeze, but you're not going to find these more detailed and intricate uh, logical vulnerabilities. Uh, what also doesn't help is very traditional fuzzing or traditional static or dynamic testing. So with uh, that, my presentation is done and we go back to Paul. Okay, thanks very much, Madi. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Cody Mercer, Senior Security Engineer with a concentration in Threat Intelligence Research at NSF Focus. So next up is Cody, and just want to remind our audience that um, we will be taking questions at the conclusion of the uh, presentation. So please submit them at any time, and we will uh, take as many as we have time for. So, um, Cody, over to you. Cody, can you hear me? Yeah. Do you have my full screen? I, I don't have screen control. All right. Let's uh, give that over to you. There we go. <clears throat> All right. Okay, Matthew, great presentation. Thank you for that. Thank you for the introduction, Steve. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. My name is Cody. I'm going to be your presenter for the next few minutes. Myself and NS Focus would like to thank you for joining us today. And we have another exciting topic to cover, which will be on the detrimental impact of vulnerable IoT devices. Uh, just a little bit about myself. As previously mentioned, I'm a senior uh, threat intelligence researcher for NS Focus. I've been working in the cybersecurity arena for well over a decade now, with the last few years with the concentration in threat intel. So without further ado, let's begin. A couple of agenda items. Introduction. What exactly is an IoT device? So uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation. It's kind of been 
uh, the buzzword keyword for the last year, so we'll go into that. Um, there's going to be some basic phases that you're going to find in a go-to-market with vulnerable IoT devices and how it gets to that stage. And then we're going to briefly talk about some real-world examples that have happened within the last year, uh, some of the biggest cybersecurity attacks that have occurred that involved IoT devices. Uh, of course, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't provide some best practices and security measures to help protect you and your company and your industry. And final with some key takeaways. So what is an IoT device? In short and sweet, it's anything with an IP address, MAC address, which can be manipulated in some way via command and control server or any other different types of methods. So nowadays, almost anything has uh, some type of IP associated with it. So a lot of news lately about the, the very vulnerable drones that are, are being sold. Uh, video camera security of video cameras, uh, which played a huge part in the Mirai attack. Of course, smart cars, and I'll get into some specific examples about that. Um, also, within the last couple of months, a uh, certain brand of televisions have known to have uh, known firmware vulnerabilities purposely installed in it, which assist in some type of reconnaissance work, uh, gaming platforms. Now we have air conditioning systems, refrigerators, electric meters, all of which have some type of RF IP associated with it, smartphones, watch fit, watches, Fitbits. And then, of course, uh, within HIPAA, the latest is healthcare devices. So even heart makers and insulin pumps and defibrillators have some type of IP MAC address associated with it, which can be manipulated in some way. Now, all of these different types of devices are used for various purposes in different types of attack campaigns. Um, a couple of examples would be DDoS, of course, uh, ransomware as a service, which is a new trending topic, DDoS as a service, which is a new trending topic, and they also serve as proxies for obfuscation purposes, such as hiding Bitcoin wallets and the anonymity of C2 servers and malware repositories. So, in a recent alarming statistic, as per the Department of Homeland Security, 90% of security incidents result from exploits against defects in software. So that's a big statement and implies that poor software development may be the biggest cyber threat of all. So, what's important to note about that is that it's not necessarily always the software developer's fault that the code is insecure um, with anything it's all about money and ROI. So you have shareholders, you have stakeholders, they have expectations and deliverables. If you're working in some type of waterfall agile methodology, you are expected to provide source code at a certain time. And oftentimes, me being a software developer and working in those environments before, you see that you can't always give the most robust code. In a perfect world, you could, but unfortunately, that's not the case. So we're gonna go through a couple of the phases from inception of a vulnerable IoT device to it actually being released into the wild and it actually being compromised. So again, it really goes back to, goes back to cost effectiveness and ROI. So for those who have worked in InfoSec departments and have worked with other departments in the development of applications, software, any type of product, you're gonna see a trend that occurs within each stage of that each of that department. So starting at the very beginning, R&D within SDLC, and when I say SDLC, it can be the solution development lifecycle or software development lifecycle. R&D is gonna tell you, we'll try to get it in there, but we have to review the budget, see, see if we can, it's cost effective, right? At that point, it goes into production and operation. Well, you need to do some type of source code analysis, SAST or DAS. You need to validate that the, the code is secure, the firmware is secure, the product is secure in itself. Um, oftentimes, you don't have those tools in place. So sometimes that, that, that's another barrier to providing a robust uh, IoT device. From that point, you go into your testing, your sandboxing. Well, then you have your engineers starting to tell you that we implemented your security protocols, but guess what? Now it's affecting our latency baselines. It's affecting our regression testing. It's affecting uh, the effectiveness and the speed and the process of the product itself. So therefore, we might have to take it out or limit it. And then you get into the integration part. So is your product integrating 
is your security preventing proper integration with other applications and other infrastructure attributes? Uh, if it is, then we might have to remove it. At that point, uh, you have a very vulnerable device, you're going to market, it's go live, it's for mass production, it's released into the wild, it's highly insecure, and guess what, it's easily compromised. So now that we have the inception, we have the uh, mass production and release of the IoT device itself, well, what keeps it vulnerable? So an owner goes out, he wants to buy a security camera or um, some type of Fitbit or something like that. He doesn't necessarily know that it has insecure firmware or software in it. He doesn't know that, oh, I need to do a patch or an update. You know, Oftentimes, if there is a required patch or firmware update, you might find that the, the update doesn't even exist yet or it's out of circulation. Perfect example, Windows XP and the WannaCry. That was the biggest exploited OS, which contributed to the effectiveness of that campaign. A lot of times the users are unaware that the default passwords uh, need to be changed. So as I go into a few of the specific examples, um, with the Mirai specifically, they were able to capitalize on the fact that it had default passwords in it, and they were able to ma manipulate it and own it. And then oftentimes you're going to find that some type of asset is going to have unnecessarily open ports or it's going to have some type of added applications to it, which also contributed to its insecurity at, at a very high level. So now that it's been released to the wild, we still have it insecure. At that point, then you have your, your state actors stepping in, you have your script kitty stepping in, you have your hackers stepping in who are going to perform their scanning and reconnaissance. So they're going to do um, any type of recon work necessary to determine whether or not your asset can be compromised. So I'll get into specific examples like with the, the Dudua security camera, but um, essentially you're scanning again, looking for unpatched systems, looking for those unopened ports. It's very easy for script kitties to either find these scripts online or develop a Python script to do nmap scanning and look for these ports, look for these uh, vulnerable OSs to compromise. And a lot of the malware can be easily obtained via darknet database repositories. So once the scanning is done, they determine that it's exploitable, and then they have a lot of resources necessary, a lot of different types of malware to actually contribute to some type of attack campaign. So phase four. Now that we have the vulnerable device out in the wild still, we have it compromised. Well, there's a lot of different attack campaigns that are associated with that, but one of the best ones is having um, a dormant sleeper in it. So a remote access Trojan that it can lay dormant within a server, within an asset, and just continually connect, collect uh, Intel reconnaissance, passwords, user identifier, um, PII, passwords, everything like that. And an example of that would be the uh, Sony hack. So that Sony hack, that compromise was actually a year and a half in the making before it was ever recognized or known. So it just lay, lay dormant, and that's one of the best ways to, to have an, an attack campaign. Again, uh, the newest, latest, greatest quiz is with ransomware as a service campaign, meaning that if you take example for the WannaCry, now people who are compromised are given the option to opt in to be a contributor to future ransomware campaigns and they will give them a percentage of the profits if they choose to permit for their IP address to be used in these attack campaigns. Uh, these also devices are going to assist as botnet armies for large DDoS attacks, volumetric size, and they're also going to serve again as proxies to facilitate in larger campaigns. So they're going to be used to serve as a proxy to hide either Bitcoin wallets or C2 servers or malware repositories. So some examples that just happened within the last year, year and a half, uh, previously compromised IOTs that contributed to some type of very high level attacks. Um, of course, we have the iPhones. Now when I talk about these, Night Skies, Joy Jack, Sidestepper, these are state sponsored. 
Uh, these were developed by the uh, United States CIA. You can look into specifics on that if you're more interested. Uh, MacBooks had dark, dark sea skies. Uh, MacBook Air had very, various types of malware associated with its firmware. And then, of course, the dual video camera, security cameras. That was a large contributor to the success of the Mirai attack, which was arguably one of the biggest DDoS attacks uh, to date. And recently, there was a dropped army a contract with specific drones that were found to be highly uh, vulnerable and easy to compromise. There's a list there if you want specifics on that. And then about six months ago, after the Equation Group and Shadow Brokers released Intel about various hacking tools developed by the state-sponsored NSA, they found that various Samsung TVs had... Um, various forms of malware associated with its firm code and, and the smart TV. So it was able to do audio and video recording um, remotely. And then of course at DEF CON and Black Hat, we saw the Tesla Model S get hacked in 2016 and the Jeep Cherokee get hacked in 2015 through man in the middle of the tax and week of firmware updates. So these are just examples of again, some very uh, easily compromised IoT devices. Now, some specific attack campaigns that have occurred, again, two of the biggest ones that have happened within the last year, the Mirai attack, which again was probably the biggest DDoS attack there is in history. Um, it did its attack processes by continually scanning various subnets and networks, looking for specific IoT devices that had default passwords and looking for spe specific OSs that had uh, unpatched systems that they could compromise. I'm not gonna go into too much of that because we beat that with the dead horse already. And then of course we had the WannaCry, which is still causing havoc. Um, it, was able to capitalize on Internal Blue, which was another state-sponsored malware development. And IoT devices assisted in obfuscation of the Bitcoin wallets that were associated with this process. And just on a global impact, when we're just talking about one attack campaign and, and, and the IoT devices associated with it, uh, again, 200,000 plus assets compromised, 200 plus uh, countries affected, it hit all major sectors, medical, industrial, financial, government, and it's still reported to have uh, some, some, some form of uh, detrimental impact as we speak. So it's important for a company or industry to understand and have the latest and greatest in IP reputation URL C2. So this is a part of the protective measures against IoT devices. So. <clears throat> To have a black-white listing of known IoT devices that have some type of malicious IP associated with it so they can upload it into um, various security appliances like WAFs and firewalls, IPSs, or some type of anti-DDoS uh, infrastructure, it's critical to the protection of their company and their assets. So you can get these either open source or provided um, for a pay service, something that, that we do. So specifically, what does having IP reputation do to help prevent uh, the attack campaigns of various IoT devices? Well, again, it's going to list the latest in C2 servers in those IP addresses. It's going to allow you to upload this intel into various protective security appliances that you may have. It's also going to block known servers that may be hosting malicious activity, uh, such as spear phishing campaigns and malware uh, repository databases, keeping your users inside of the network from going and hitting those uh, IPs or having those IPs externally hit your uh, infrastructure is critical. So again, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tell you some of the best practices and best ways to protect yourself. Um, that's what we're here for. Uh, make sure that you have some type of change configuration management in place. Ensure that all your IoT devices that you may be using either at home or in your network, in your office space, all have the latest and greatest in software, firmware, and patch updates. Make sure that you're able to obtain some type of uh, reputational feed related to IPs, URLs, and C2 servers. So you can upload those into your firewalls and uh, outward facing infrastructure.
Ransomware, one of the best ways to protect against ransomware attacks, it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when, is that you have multiple backups in multiple locations, either in the cloud, on-prem, and remotely, and you have that uh, Intel encrypted data uh, encrypted at rest and data encrypted in transit with some type of PKI infrastructure associated with it. Also, you wanna have a threat and vulnerability management program in place, so making sure, again, that your default passwords have been changed and uh, the latest and greatest in software updates have been applied. Also, the biggest risk to any company organization is yourself. So users are the biggest threat to any company because they have direct access to those assets. And so having continuous employee training is absolutely crucial. All right, so some key takeaways. The IoT SDLC process, deployment process, is a very precarious industry and it's continued to pose exceptional danger uh, for the future uh, on a global scale. And oftentimes owners of these compromised IoTs aren't even aware that the IoTs are being uh, used for some type of illegal operation. So again, uh, knowledge is key and training is key. And continuous access to updated reputational data can significantly increase your protective measures, both in depth and in breadth within your infrastructure. So that brings me to my conclusion. Here is my number, my email. If you wanna talk offline and have more questions specifically, feel free to reach out to me and we're happy to help in any way possible. Thanks again. Okay, nice Thank job, Cody, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, we just have a few minutes uh, for Q&A, so um, we'll uh, see what we have for questions. Uh, before we do that, I just wanted to remind our audience that we have a feedback survey at the conclusion of the webcast, and we would greatly appreciate it if you could fill that out and uh, let us know how we did and how we can improve in the future. Also, uh, while we're asking questions, uh, I'm going to push out uh, some handouts, the PDF versions of the two uh, presentations. So those should also come to you uh, in a moment. Uh, but first off, let's um, ask a question. Uh, Maddie, I have a question here for you uh, from Dennis. Um, is the tool available uh, online and are you planning to improve it further? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, the current tool is not yet uh, available online, so if you do want to apply this to test uh, some Wi-Fi implementations, uh, do contact us. Um, the reason it is not yet available is because we are working on improvements uh, together with uh, other researchers as well. And we plan to release some tool to detect logical vulnerabilities, but that's uh, a long-term goal and could take a year or more. But if you are interested in this or the tool, uh, feel free to contact me. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, I just sent out um, uh, the files to the, um, the two webcast uh, presentations, so you should be able to, uh, to download those. If you can't, uh, also they'll be available on the Black Hat website uh, in the next uh, day or so. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we're gonna have for this session, so if we didn't get to your question, uh, during the live broadcast, someone will follow up with you over the next few business days. And a reminder, please uh, complete that feedback survey. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you all for attending today's Black Hat webinar, Securely Implementing Network Protocols, Detecting and Preventing Logical Flaws, brought to you by Black Hat, NS Focus, and UBM. Shortly after this live event, we'll send you an email so you can access this presentation on demand. Uh, web, this webcast is copyright 2017 by UBM. Presentation materials are owned by or copyright, if that is the case, by Black Hat, NSF Focus, and UBM, who are solely responsible for its content, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. And on behalf of our expert guests, Mati Van Loof, postdoctoral researcher at KU Leuven, and our sponsor presenter, Cody Mercer, Senior Security Engineer with a concentration in Threat Intelligence Research at NSF Focus. We want to thank you for your time and have a great day.